<laughs> Good. Well, once again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard the weekly vlog podcast we call the SBAU Astro Hour, viewable live 11 to noon and every Monday morning on YouTube. It's hooked up with them right now for members or non members or future members of the South Coast of Central California's Longtime Telescope and Astrophysics Club, the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. My name's Ron Heron. I like to say we're 93 million miles of facts, fun, and frivolity and the Fermi paradox. We're not going to talk about that today, I don't think. We're based in the beautiful Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, which supports us. And doggone SBAU has been around a long time, changed their name to this about 20 or so years ago. Uh, this is the first Friday of April. General meeting coming up uh, this coming Friday will be five days away. This is our first uh, April meeting online of the SBAU Astro. Hour. We're going to talk about the planets have been lined up and they're starting to scatter. We'll get a report from one of our guys. We're going to try to find the trapezium star cluster out there in space. Check out new one and new two, spelled N-U in Boatos and raging dust storms on an exoplanet. James Webb apparently caught it. Black holes are back in the news. This one's fleeing a far off galaxy. But let's meet the gang. I'm vice president. To my left on my screen is our beloved president after five or six years, Jerry Wilson. Good morning. <laughs> Married to Good one morning. of two Pats. Pat Forge is the member. To my right is our incredibly outrageously outreachable outreach coordinator, <laughs> Chuck McPartland. <laughs> who's been taking on just incredible visits to places like Ritz-Carlton. We're going to check with him in a minute. Uh, also logging in on the bottom of my screen on the left is uh, Bruce Murdoch, who is uh, now scratching his nose. He's married to Bonnie. Uh, Chuck is married to uh, Pat, our merchandise manager. And doggone, if Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society still su survives and did and is back doing things live. Mr. Bruce, and on right. my lower we right have, is... We have an open console on the 8th of April. 8th of April what? We have an open console on the 8th of April. That Saturday. should be Sunday? Saturday. Saturday. Oh, okay, at the beautiful Arlington. Right at the Arlington, between this 9 and 11. Up. Okay. What time of the day is that, Bruce? Between 9 and 11 a.m. Okay, so get there by 9 and the door will be open and just come in and yes. enjoy... Box Fugue and D, Toccata oh, for, play that for somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody the street side door, the one you go down a flight of stairs, the main doors of the theater will not be open. All right. I, you don't have one at home, though, do you? None of us do. I have an electronic uh, organ. Oh, a little Hammond or a Kawasaki or? Con, C-O-N. I got to tell you, there's bread baking at Tom Whittemore's house, our former Westmont science instructor, lower right of my screen. How, how's your wife, Maureen? Fine, fine. She just walked. Uh, we had a nice walk with Wally, our dog. You're the one you know, guy with the telescope that checks out most of these planets lined up. So we're going to probably tap your brain and get the uh, the script or the agenda for monthly things happening. Outreach from Chuck, whose head has gone to the bottom of his screen for some reason. <laughs> the, cat, the cat face rubs the screen and pushes it down. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we also have a lot of levity sent to us on our email inboxes by our beloved president uh, because he loves those cartoons, especially if they're science rated. And some of yeah. them are, and some of them are downright silly. Others are groaners. But let's see what we have, including some new ones we didn't get. We'll make do with what we have here. Took this on my iPhone 18 last night. I think I may have over edited it. Baloney. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. It's Jupiter inside. Okay. So I had a couple of these that I didn't mail to anyone in the club because I wasn't sure I was going to put them up. They're funny, but they they border on with the way people take things wrong. So I wasn't. Sure. Sure. So well, all the gas planets have rings, and now we discover in one of your cartoons. So does the Earth. Is it possible to call that one up? Since they're back. The Earth. Back? What are the rings around Earth? Oh. You don't yeah. know. What, what no, I don't have that one. one. You don't have that one? No. All right. We'll do a limerick. Uh-oh. This is actually a repeat. We've done this one before. Yeah, we've done yeah. this one. Doesn't look like a limerick to you. Try that. Doesn't a gross of the score plus three times the square root of four 
divided by seven plus five times 11 is nine squared and not a bit more. Heck, heck, <laughs> heck, and there it is. What is that, right. incidentally? I, I like that one. Yeah, it's good. It's good. This is this an irrational number again? No. Oh, no, it's, it. no, oh, no. Uh -uh. Irrational. No, it's nine just squared a cleverly and not a bit more. Range formula. Did we yeah. have with him this one before? This is a couple of weeks old, but it's cute as hell. The time machine is in the shop, and the mechanic <laughs> has to tell the guy, look, I'm going to have to order a part. Should take about, oh, three, four hundred years. <laughs> Got to invent it first. <laughs> Back to the limerick. Okay. Oh, uh, no. What are we seeing here? Is this, <laughs> this is a rare transit of Saturn. <laughs> <laughs> Very rare. <clears throat> a rare transit of what? Saturn. See the rings? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, I see it. Uh, from Aaron, huh? <laughs> uh, there's actually two of those this month, and one claimed the other one is a fake. It was photoshopped. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I was gonna say. That's see, this, this one claimed the other one was faked. Yeah. <laughs> that's the view they're getting out on the exoplanets, any civilization <laughs> out there. All right, that's a new one. You're right. <laughs> Kind of, oh, here we go. You're you're abducted by aliens, and guess what they turn out to be? Oh, right into your oh, eyes. Got them. Yep, your <laughs> cats take revenge. There they <laughs> I'll blow that one up. A little peanuts. I did write something, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's Lucy talking to is the a bird of the lucky bird called Schroeder. That, that's Peppermint Wood, Patty. Woodstock yeah. is the bird. Yeah. Woodstock's the bird. Oh, I'm, I'm, who is Schroeder? Wasn't there a Schroeder he in place? The piano. The piano. Oh, he, piano. I got it. So uh, loves Beethoven. <laughs> yeah. All right. And the uh, square root of 0.2 over the square root of. Okay. Well, let's just read it. No, square root of two over the square root of six. <clears throat> you can solve that in the very first thing because when you have uh, square roots up and down, you can combine them. So that's that right? square root of, of two over six or uh, seven over the square root of three. If you want to multiply top and bottom by the square root of three, then you get exactly the thing they have at the end. You know, I've forgotten how to do, to take square roots. What's the process is, you know, division I can still do. I know my multiplication tables. Nowadays, you just look it up on your calculator. Right. That's right. right. Doing that in grade school. That's right. In Fine. graduate school, I caught you when calculators had first come out. I actually caught myself reaching for a calculator to take the square root of 16. <laughs> I thought, okay, these are prepped in too much. Did you all have uh, slide rules back then? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We had special class on them. On them. Yeah. Oh, they're yeah. replaced by something today. Well, thank you for a little levity, Mr. President. <coughs> uh, it's April 3rd. I hope nobody nailed you on April 1st with you know what kind of fool's day, but uh, I, I want, want to go to Chuck. Uh, we went to, um, let's see, Ritz Carlton and I mean, we may be going there a lot, depending on what the outreach calendar is like. What's happening with our club? Well, we've got the the big thing is we got the meeting on Friday. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we have on Saturday, we have the monthly star party, second Saturday of every month. So that's coming up this week. Right. Um, we did go to Bacara for, for a test run, they were calling it, uh, in the last two weeks sometime. And they want us there this Sunday on, on the 9th. On Easter Sunday. Yeah. A uh, nighttime, not a daytime thing like coming. Oh, not a daytime, out. yeah. All depends seven, seven. whether the clouds win. <clears throat> that, Bruce, what? I said it all depends whether the clouds win. Yeah. Oh. I look okay. out at night now, you know, when I, I don't go to bed until like two or three in the morning. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, like last night with the moon out, I could, I could see uh, uh, Sirius. And I could see Rigel. I could I could see maybe a dozen stars at most. Hmm. You know, it really it's uh, the the the, the uh, with the humidity and the thin cloud layer that we have uh, sometimes. It, it's just full moon. Uh, no, exactly. Uh, yeah, right. So, um, if you look at the clear sky chart, that's uh -huh. for this uh, this coming Sunday. That's this coming Sunday, the ninth. Yes. Well, that doesn't go out that far. Well, we're supposed to have another storm. Oh, we are. I but if you take a look at a clear sky chart, it's just um, it's not good. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at transparency and seeing all the way across, it's not dark. 
Hmm. Well, that, that has nothing to do with darkness, but yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. no. I mean, the, 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 the colors of the, uh, yeah. the squares, all right? The darker this color of the square, the better things are. Yeah. Well, what about uh, Astronomy Day, Captain Outreach? That's coming up on the 29th, and we'll be out at Community Rail Marketplace uh, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., basically, uh, set up at 9. Uh, solar scopes and activities during the day, and then a star party in the evening. Okay. And are we still going to get Chrissy Cook's services uh, in the club? She's still with us. So she's stepping down, I guess, at the museum. Well, she's, she's not going to be at the museum as an employee anymore, but she'll still be in the club. She'll still be around. Good. And for Astronomy Day, actually, she has got Rocio Kimon to come up from uh, Caltech with some grad students to help out, too. Okay. Um, well, the last time we used the uh, Zoom for our meeting was December when uh, the president, who's on the screen, did a nice talk, and we sort of got through it with some sound problems, didn't we? Um, but Actually, we haven't been, had we, sound problems recently. Yeah, we've been doing Zoom every month. Yeah. That's true, but we haven't had a speaker on the screen in, uh, since December, and that'll be Dr. Dan Gilman of University okay. of Toronto. So you mean the speaker, the speaker is zooming in. Yes. Yeah, yeah. well, we hope he can hear us and uh, we can hear him. And they, uh, Anyway, we got a great well, club. We enjoy doing this. A, let's go through a rundown of the planets this week. <laughs> okay. Can you, can you see my posting? Yep, I wrote it all yeah. down. I've got it here. Uh, just, just to clarify that full moon at 9.35 p.m. PDT is on the 5th. So it's this Thursday. Yeah. Yeah, fifth. No, is that right? The fifth is Wednesday. It's Passover. Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. Excuse me. Yeah, it's on the fifth. I, 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 nine thirty-five. I'm not sure is the right time. Anyway, close enough. <laughs> also called the Pink Moon or the Madonna Moon, probably. Mm -hmm. According to Farmer's Almanac, not Poor Richard's name comes from the flowers that bloom in early spring. Of course. Mm -hmm. We're going to have flowers and more weeds like you wouldn't believe. Okay, but the, the gist of it here is that the planets have largely passed over the sky from morning six months ago to the evening, and now they're close to the sun or in conjunction with the sun. Jupiter has slipped below the horizon, the western horizon, and will rise next month uh, in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, Saturn, Saturn is now in the early morning before the sun, mm -hmm. or, um, yeah, before sunrise. Um, Pluto has done the same. The Earth has just passed our vernal equinox. And Venus is the very bright star in the evening, uh, just after sunset. Right. So, Under Mars has barely. really been hanging in there. The yeah. what? Mars yeah, has Mars. really been hanging in there. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's yeah Mars, yeah. I think, is about seven seconds of an arc across its disk. So yeah. it's quite small and fairly difficult to see any surface features. Right. Yeah. But for the benefit of the lay people that may not know all the details, just because we see them lined up in the sky doesn't mean they're on one side of the sun. Every All of them does it. No. That happened when they were all on one side of the sun and all in a true line um, within a few degrees of each other in the sky was April of 1964. Okay. Well, I heard there was a big lineup when they launched the two Voyagers because they wanted to go out by them. They were all on well, the that was a that, That's not that kind of lineup, Ron. Yeah, that's a different kind. <laughs> they were lined up so that the plant, the, our probe could swing by them and get gravitational assists one after the other and build up a tremendous speed to actually exit the solar system. Well, I know, but if it's exiting in one direction, all the planets better be over in that direction. They no, can't it, be on the Ron, when, when it swings by the planets to get the gravity assist, it changes direction. So they had to be lined up in a way that contributed to visiting each of the other planets, but not necessarily yeah. lined up from our point of view. So it zigzagged its way out of the solar system. Yeah. yeah. And just a little comment here to place Easter. Easter is, you know, defined as the first Sunday after the first full moon after the equinox, the vernal equinox. And we just had the vernal equinox a couple of Mondays ago. So now we're getting our full moon and then Sunday, our first Sunday after the full moon. So it's a fairly early Easter in that sense, fairly early. I heard Bill Maher say the other night on 
uh, TV that uh, on Easter Sunday, what are we going to do? Take all our expensive rare eggs and hide them on a lawn somewhere, you know, for the kids. <laughs> yeah. All right. Where are we now in deep space? We are looking. We're going to head for the trapezium. Uh, oh, yeah. A okay. good uh, asterism star cluster. It's in the, wait a second, I got my glasses. I can't even see the screen here. Mm -hmm. And the sword. All right. So this shows the belt of Orion on the tack here. I can't pronounce that one. Saif, Saif. Saif, yes, yeah, thank you. Rigel. Um, mm -hmm. And so hanging down from it here, the three stars of the, so supposedly in, in quotation marks, three stars of the, Sword of Orion and the center one is actually not a star. It's the um, M43, the Great Nebula in Orion, and the trapezium is a star cluster at the core mm -hmm. of the nebula. This is actually M43 here. M42. <laughs> and M42. M42 is the main nebula. M43 is the one up top. Running okay. man. Oh, yeah, I got him. Yeah. Yeah, and the, it's uh, pretty washed out in here, but this, um, with an R, pretty uh, washed out, uh, but uh, in here is the trapezium in the densest part of the nebula. Okay. And the processor of this particular image, I forget who, um, has done a really <laughs> good job of not- But it was <laughs> Bob Richard. <laughs> it could have been. Um, I think that's uh, a collaboration I, between him and myself because I took his picture, <clears throat> which had was wonderful about the running man and so forth, but it was completely blown out in the trans trapezium. Yeah. Yeah. And, you and cut me off off on I took my, my picture on my... and pasted it in on his <laughs> and blended it. You cut so me you off on my everything. citation to you, Bruce. Pardon? Oh, you cut me off on my citation to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, was say, I didn't know. I didn't know who had done this. It was possibly Bob Richards and, um, and Bruce but it's an excellent job. I've got a bunch of photographs from a bunch of people in our club and I don't have the labels at, or on them. Bob Richard, by the way, uh, they just celebrated the first anniversary of their observatory that he built at their uh, retirement oh. center uh, there in Arizona. And there's a link in the newsletter to a video from a local TV station interviewing him about it. Oh, it's pretty good. I'll look for that. Thank you. And thanks for the- Jerry, don't you read your newsletter? <laughs> so as we look at this i picture, don't think i've got it yet wow oh, should have you should have because chuck I, chuck sends it out to a little group first oh kind of looks okay. like a snowman oh, up here running man. with the a head attached man up top. but you want to sing he flies through the air with the greatest of ease that daring <laughs> young nebula with nothing to breathe okay <laughs> <laughs> These, so this is the trapezium, mm -hmm. little trapezoid, um, oh, nice. with some extra stars in it. And the test with a visual telescope is how many stars can you see? Pretty much everybody mm -hmm. can see four. Mm -hmm. um, and but this is, and here the, the nebula has been suppressed mm -hmm. so that you can see the stars. And so the entire star, the whole star, is called Theta. The trapezium is called Theta Orionis. As if it's one star. Mm -hmm. Really? Um, is it a uh, not a binary, but a quark? There, they're not all gravitationally right. in orbit, Ron. They are gravitationally bound, probably, but not in orbit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, that you'll find in most star clusters. They're kind of orbiting around each other as it goes around the galaxy. Not when they're this far apart. Oh. But... Well, are, were they all made of the stuff from the nebula? Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah I would think so. Mm -hmm. Most likely. Someone answer yeah. your phone. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the, the, the thing that people always ask about the trapezium when you see it is, do you see the E star? Mm -hmm. And if you see the E, then they're, they go down to the F and G, O, H, I. That's so how far point. down you can see is a test of... Um, your mirror, your telescope, the size and the quality of the mirror. I just gonna mention my homemade eight inch. I've seen uh, both the E and the F, but then with my 18 inch, I've, I pulled off the G. It's gotta be a super night though, because that's mm -hmm. pretty dim. Yeah. 
but they're all independent. None of them are orbiting each other. F's not orbiting C and E's not orbiting A. I don't recall that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I just look at them as a nice little collection of stars. Yeah, they're and, so uh, big, I would expect them not to be gravitationally bound. In a test for how good your telescope mirror is, like Jerry said. Yeah. And um, they haven't changed position very much. So if, if they mm -hmm. are at all uh, orbiting, it's a very, very, very long period. Mm -hmm. Well, would this be called an asterism? Yes. Yes, yes mm -hmm. it would. Mm -hmm. But only you can only see it through a telescope. Well, yes, I think so. Oh, yes. Well, you can I mean, only resolve it into multiple stars in a telescope. That's what yeah. I mean. Yeah. 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 I don't think this. You can do that with binoculars, Ron. I, I, wow. I think they're a little too tight. No kidding. And yet there's light years between them. Wow. Oh yes. Oh, they're yes. far away. Mm -hmm. I wonder how close stars can get before they become gravitationally locked as binaries. Light months, light weeks. Depends on the masses. Yeah, right, right. It depends on their motion, too. Yeah. And, you know, to have an orbit, you have to be a certain distance away and you have to um, be moving sideways at a very specific uh, speed to maintain an orbit. If you, because um, the gravitational field of the parent star goes out to infinity. So if there, if nothing else interferes, you could orbit at any distance you want. But of course, in a galaxy, something else always interferes. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that too. But <laughs> what gets me is that we know what's around our solar system, all this refuge and rocks and Oort clouds and Kuiper belts. You suppose they have all of that and maybe even other things around every one of these stars? Wouldn't that all overlap some of that stuff? I don't think our solar system is unique. That's what I mean. Maybe in the details, but yeah, I think they're pretty much all, all the same. Wow. Really, really massive stars like this have really strong winds and strong ultraviolet radiation coming off of them. So they would tend to kind of disperse Oort cloud type objects. Mm -hmm. Really? And our sun doesn't. Well, it, it's cleared out the inner area that we're living in. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they, they've all got leftover rocks and stuff from their original creation, I would say. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, they could have formed out of a cloud of just hydrogen. Okay. But all they're all named after letters. That's all. We don't have individual. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good. Okay, Fantastic. let's see. This Thank is, um, yeah, I've this never is seen a... the H stars. I've never seen the H's, you know. Okay, Boates. Get you, um, Boates, I called it Brutus. <laughs> You're a Buddhist. Yeah. And you. So in this constellation, um, right over here mm -hmm. is new, that's, um, uh, English spelling of the Greek letter new. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a double star. And most of these double stars that collect um, people's attention are contrasting colors such as blue and gold. And that's the Jerry, case here. Jerry, to interrupt for a second, because of the 20 second delay, I just got a question from Tim, mm -hmm. Tim Crawford. He was wondering where you got that chart for the trapezium. Um, like I knew. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, I think that's on Wikipedia. Okay. Okay, Tim, Wikipedia. <laughs> they don't want Orionis. All right, thanks, Jerry. Okay. Okay, when you say a double star, is that the same as a binary? This no. is... Uh, no, it's just... Not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, binary means they're orbiting each other. Double star just means they're close to each other. This is a double. It's a bright double. It's a contrasting color double. So it's a good target for right now because we have uh, the full moon coming in two days or three days, mm -hmm. depending on how you're counting it. And <laughs> um, so there's not a lot of faint fuzzies you're going to see, but stars can, you can see that uh, frequently, especially when they're, this is what, fifth magnitude or something? Yeah, so, that's, that's a nice, that's a nice pair. It's going to yeah. mention, you see Arcturus coming up uh, in the east, northeast, oh, I don't know, 830, something like that now? Yeah. Yeah. This is so, a double? New will be a little bit later. Yeah, this is this yes, is yes, new, but zoomed in. New one and new two. 
new one and new two, yeah. Hmm. And um, also, my planetarium program doesn't identify any of these things, so I'm switching to a new planetarium program. <laughs> I heard there's a giant uh, vacuum space area where nothing is there called the Boatus Void. Are you aware of that? Is that nearby this? Well, that's, there's, that, it's not, it's in that direction in the sky is all you can say, really. Okay, but it's not something that you notice in your your telescope lenses. There's a big vast gap in space there, Pat. Take a look. <laughs> when you see vast blacknesses in your scope, you're usually looking at a Barnard Nebula. <laughs> it's not lit up. Or it's you've left your old. dust cap on. Yeah, I, I would really say that. Yeah, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> Especially on the finder scope. Yeah. There's, yeah. A, there's, a neat, there's a neat, I just mentioned that there's a neat story about Arcturus and using the light from Arcturus to light up the, no, no pun intended, to light up the 1933 exhibition in, in um, Chicago. So by 1933, we had uh, photo detectors strong enough to trip switches. By oh, that's right. I remember that. Yeah, that's a really cool story. And what happened was, um, they were thinking that Arcturus was about 40 light years away. And the last uh, world exposition was in 1893, okay? So it turns out they were, they were wrong by a handful of light years, but it's just a neat story that the light from Arcturus actually triggered all the lighting in Chicago at, at the exposition. It's pretty cute. How in the world did they do that? Why wouldn't they use Sirius? That's the brightest. Well, you, you need to put the light through a scope of some kind, some sort of a magnifier, and yeah. then you know flash that onto a photo detector that would trip a switch. Okay, and, that and run. the The reason that they picked that star, Arcturus, is yeah. like like Tom said, <laughs> they thought it, the light took forty years to get there, and they had <laughs> had the exposition forty years earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Synergy. So the light left Arcturus at the previous exhibition and it arrived right. at this exhibition. Right. Yeah, so there's a time connection, Jerry. Yeah, yeah. You're right. Thanks, thanks, okay. uh, Jeff. Hmm. And I think okay, the exposition so in 93 was in Paris, if I remember right. Okay, how many people can pronounce pareidolia? <laughs> Obviously, you can. <laughs> well, that's one interpretation, but I just want to hear anyone got a better idea. There's an EI in the middle, Paraya Dolia, in his orchestra. <laughs> Paradolia, yeah. Anyway, this shows the, uh, this is a map of the moon. It's not a picture of the moon, although it looks like it's assembled out of many pictures. The, um, uh, we'll cover a lot of these things, but there's, um, coming up. This is an article from uh, Sky and Telescope magazine. Covers it really well. I took the pictures out. So these are things, par this thing, pareidolia, is the ability of the human eye to spot patterns in uh, uh, randomness. Like you lay in your backyard and you look at clouds and you think, oh, that looks like Snoopy flying on his doghouse. <laughs> you know, you're, you're making pictures out of it. So the most famous one probably is the man in the moon. And these are different, but there are different versions of man in the moon. And this, these are three different versions of it. This is the one I always see when I look at the moon. Um, but this one, no, this is the one I always see. Mm -hmm. I have to squint because there's too much resolution on this to get the image. But this one, I have no idea. I can't even figure out how that's a. Oh, see, that and that's the one I always see. Yeah, I see the woman in the moon more. more huh. great. Well, where's the head or the eye or the nose or any feature? Well, well see, side view. Uh, it's a side view, and she's looking up. She's wearing a, a brooch, you know, down oh, there. Oh, I see it. Cluster. Yeah. yeah, this is her profile with the nose. Yes. The yes chin, the yeah, mouth. she's looking oh. up and left. Yeah, and this is her and hair. That's, that's yeah. her beautiful hair. Huh. Okay. Oh, that now I can't unsee it. Thanks. Yeah. And Pat <laughs> says it's Lucille Ball. <laughs> well, you all, it does look kind of like that. You you did start this by comparing uh, what we're seeing to the face on Mars. Recently, they took a picture looking down from the orbiter, and it looked like a face looking back up. Yeah. And there's a couple <laughs> other 
what do they call well, these pareidolias on Mars? Yeah. Like, well, but... so and and the canals on Mars are one version of that. Um, things that you see that aren't there. So this in uh, technical optics, this is where some people claim that the human eye has a modulation transfer function of greater than one. That is, you can actually <laughs> see things that aren't there. <laughs> yeah, it's scary. What about the count? So this is, is, this hmm. is um, at one of the... Um, oh, an uh, X. Half, the and an X. The quarter, quarter moon, quarter phase. You can see a lunar V and a lunar X. <laughs> They're only there for a couple hours. Chuck, you said you have written down where, when these occurred? Right, they, they depend on, on both the, the phasing of the moon and uh, whatever libration is going on. Plus you have to have the moon up in your sky at the time when they appear, because it only lasts about a little over two hours, mm -hmm. for three hours in that neighborhood, two and a half. So the next time we see it in, in this month is uh, March 28th from about 10.40 p.m to 113 the next morning. And then April 27th. Oh, I'm sorry, we've already passed uh, we've already yeah. passed March 28th. And yeah. then there's April 27th from 1207 to 1330, so basically for about an hour uh, after it rises uh, on the 27th of this month. And then the next one is uh, May 26th from 11 for, uh, 1043 to 117 the next morning. And then it skips a month because it's not going to be up in our sky when the X is visible. And it becomes July 24th from 1022 to 1054 p.m. And then the next one is September 21st from 746 to 1018 p.m. And then November 19th from 909 to 1112 in the evening. And then on December 19th, from uh, 12 minutes afternoon until 2.12 uh, in the afternoon, just after it rises. Okay. Yeah, these are basically a little bit fatter than the first quarter, right, Chuck? Yeah. Yeah. Just past first quarter. Okay. And this is a very nice picture, a high-resolution picture yeah. we found of the moon. Yeah. The, the Lunar X is a Tim Crawford favorite. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> is he calling in right now? He's he's texting, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen the V, Chuck. Or Jerry. I've I've seen the V, but I, I I had known about the X first, and then somewhere I yes. read, oh, at the same time there's a V, and I went looking for it, and it is there. Okay, yeah. so they're only viewable when the moon is on the black on one side, and what do they call that? The dividing line. Terminator. Yeah, it's it's very it's very dependent on the sun angle, so you got to yeah. get things just right. Yeah, these are like crisscrossing uh, crater walls, Ron. Yeah. You know, that's why you see it. Well, boy, some of your science fiction writers have had a ball with strange uh, <laughs> things on Mars, you know, a lot a sphinx. <laughs> What's the name of the crater where they found the obelisk in 2001? Cl Clavius? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, Clavius, yeah. That's in the south, isn't it? Where's yeah. Yep. And I just found out recently, I think he was a Jesuit priest. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. Clavius? Yeah. Saint yeah. Clavius? No, he's not a saint. I think he's just a Jesuit uh, astronomer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know that the first uh, Jesuit pope in history is the guy we got in there now? It's yeah. Chicanus? Yeah. Yes. The teaching order. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and that order is named after their main guy, Jesus, instead of. That's right. Mm -hmm. St. Francis or somebody else. No, yeah, he goes to my he goes to my church, Ron. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> okay. How but he also does the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> Watch it. Watch it, Chuck. <laughs> What's the difference between these two pictures, Mr. President? Are we supposed to find the difference? Two hours. Okay. Oh, face it, start. So yeah. So there um I don't see a face here. So I, I don't see a face very well in either in those shadows, but in the one on the left, yeah, mm -hmm. it looks to me like a kid looking upward. He's got a lot of hair and he's holding an apple in his hand. <laughs> and it's kind of covering his chin. Well, you see a whole storyline there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. See, I see a face here. There's one eye, one another eye, the nose. Oh, I see. Smile. Yeah, it's sideways. Uh, it's really slightly different. The thing pointing... that you saw the other eye is his mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, see, to me, that other big eye, Klein, is the apple. And then down there, the, the upper rim of parrot is the kid's hand holding the apple. Uh huh. And then that little tiny crater on the left is, is an eye, a small eye. This one? The little tiny one right below it. That's the eye. Mm. Okay. And then if you go more to the left over there, there's another tiny one. And that's, uh, yeah, uh, right there. Yeah. And that's like his nose. <laughs> He's got a lot of hair. And his you ear is bent forward and he really looks weird. So never mind. <laughs> okay. Next time, decaf. Yeah. Like a Pablo Picasso painting. Yeah. Cubism. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on that with a question mark. <laughs> All right. Now this is um, I think this is Clavius down here. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And at this phase, these two things look like eyes staring yeah. back at you out of a dark face. <laughs> It's it's one of those critters from uh, uh, Despicable Me, right? What are they? Oh, it's a minion. Yeah, a minion. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. there's this there's this uh, little slab of black granite buried there somewhere. Yeah. So it's near the south pole of the moon, Ron. Is it really pretty pretty, pretty section? Really pretty section. Well, are those two set two little craters inside a big crater? Then right. Yeah, they're actually, you know, that when I show this at Westmont, there's there's like an arc of craters inside Clavius. Really pretty. Yeah, Clavius is a very distinctive crater that yes, stands yeah. out. And um, well, Clavius is right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there it is. But you can't see the arc of craters in there. <laughs> right, right. Not, not in that shot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do many craters, if not most, have that teardrop? response in the middle that that's only ones that are really violent impacts the, yeah. the central peak yeah the central yeah. thing is... that's what the recoil like you see a uh, drop of milk you know yeah exactly yeah. it's why I'm... now going back to this one the mm -hmm. caption says that the arrow points to the nose okay but i don't... they're just using the black shadow as the face right yeah i think so yeah. but i don't see it yeah. Well, you could see dozens if you want. It looks like it looks like a face looking up there, and that's the nose, and this is the chin. Smile, yeah, I think people nose. have been watching too much Alfred Hitchcock uh, TV <laughs> show, you know, where he comes on. <laughs> yeah. Well, My conspiracy think... theory brain doesn't work. <laughs> wow. Hey, this is um, an amateur in Germany that. Um, um, drew the picture of um, this light ray on Hesiodus going through and shining on the other wall. There's a big gap there, huh? He used a 10-inch yeah. Dobsonian on uh, February 2021. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, there's a real art to drawing this, things this is, like this. Yeah, this is not a face, it's just a... Uh, we had a, when I was in the San Jose Club, we had a, a member who was just phenomenal at doing that. And her name was Jane Houston Jones. And she drew a, an incredible sunrise on uh, Gassendi. Gassendi. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, this is you got to use the, you know, the white chalk on black paper and yeah. mm -hmm. smudge it. And yeah, it's real art. It's real well, art. Well, you can do it with. Pen, I've done it with pencil on white paper, and then you photograph mm -hmm. it and flip it as a negative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is potatoes? Another crater. Oh, well, it didn't look like it. Yeah, right there, potatoes. That's the That's singular true. potatoes. <laughs> potatoes. <laughs> as opposed to potato eye. I got you. Yeah, we had a uh, woman at work uh, that started off with a piece of uh, smoked paper so you can scratch it you know it was black yeah. as you get the white underneath <laughs> and with a needle that's the way she did the uh her work and she was excellent yeah Great pictures that's me, but... mm -hmm. now this one is i never heard of this or have seen it uh it's supposed to be a pair of scissors and someone no. has drawn as someone has drawn in 
white lines to represent what they see as the scissors. I see. And while you can fit these craters on a pair of scissors, that's not what stands out to my eye without the white lines. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Locus mortis. Yeah. Sea of, death. sea of death. Yeah. Or, uh, lake, lake, lake of death. Now, the next one is supposed to be the city on the moon. Now, this requires a low resolution look at this rough area of texture here near Sinus Aestum, near the crater Schroeder. So, this is supposed to be the lunar city. And here's a map made by the person <laughs> who discovered that city, uh, Andrew Planck, sketched by Franz von Grusian in 1822. Wow. So this was a time when they probably thought that the the dark areas on the moon really were seas. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they didn't have high resolution <laughs> images. Oh, that's the reason. Hmm. Yeah, most of these things, if you want to see them, you have to squint a little bit. So <laughs> when you get more detail, the thing you see goes away. And that happened with the face on Mars. Once you got a high resolution picture of it, you, you just see it as a jumble of a broken down mountain peak. Well, there's a W in the bottom of that oval. Does that stand for West, or is that the name of that little dinky crater we're looking at next? Week? That's it's um, probably Schroeder West or something like that. Oh, you know, we're starting to see pictures from Mars for Perseverance that I never thought I'd see before over all these years of visiting and landing on the flattest places we could find, and there's nothing but maybe a rolling hill. I got some buttes and big mountains around Perseverance. Yeah, when I look at those, it's hard to believe there's not shrubs growing just on the other side of the hill. <laughs> I thought the same thing. I said, that's all it needs, and it'll be Arizona. <laughs> hmm. Now, this one um, is a, the first thing that I saw when I got my first six-inch telescope, which I made back in 1960 or 59 or something, uh, the jeweled handle, which is the outer rim of Marcrisium or planet Sinus Iridium, I mean. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, but there's also, um, at this point here, there's also a, what looks like a, a woman with hair, blowing hair. And that's shown here as the moon maiden. Oh, so this oh is my one God. peak. Yeah, and this is a copy of a drawing by Cassini, I think. Yeah, his name's in the lower right there. Oh yeah, okay, good, good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I've looked at that under certain lighting and uh, low power, and it does, does you can't imagine this is there. <laughs> but my telescope was a good telescope. <laughs> so <laughs> you just had to have it on low power. So, okay, well, forgive me, but are we looking at the buxom part of the maiden? Or is... No, it's her face. See, there's her hair, and her hair flows this way. Oh, I see. It. See, there's her nose and her chin, mm -hmm. and her okay. eyebrow, she's looking this way. Mm -hmm. So it's a profile image of her face. I just thought we were looking at the Dolly Parton two uh, round areas there next to it. But that... I don't see that. <laughs> see. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> it looks like he's given a little bit of a bias to these craters that each look like they're little scallops going up this way. Mm -hmm. So I think that's just... Uh, his personal bias there. <laughs> anyway, Same with that grouping below. <laughs> well, he had a good telescope, didn't he, Cassini? Um, not terribly. I don't know what, what scope he used. Now, this is an it artist was, rendering of an exoplanet, isn't it? This yeah. is um, a, a large exoplanet that is well, dusty. VHS. 1256b, which is about 40 light years from Earth, and it was discovered um, in 2015 by the UK's Vista Telescope in Chile. It is the Super Jupiter, wow. about 12 to 18 times the mass of Jupiter. And, so like a brown um, dwarf almost. Yeah. yeah, almost. And so this is about, it takes 10,000 years to go around its, its two parent stars. See, this is not, so the two parent stars, this is, by the way, a drawing. Don't think this is a photo from James Webb. 
So this, these are the two parent stars. And because this is just a super Jupiter, so I guess they felt obligated to put in the great red spot. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and um, it's about four times the distance that Pluto is from our sun. So th this would count for that star system it would count like the planet X for us. It's what we're looking for outside of our, in our Kuiper belt or beyond. But... Mm. Uh, the spectra that they take in the infrared for the first time, James Webb gives them a look at the infrared spectra. They see carbon monoxide and methane in the atmosphere. Uh, wow. And they also see silica dust, which is uh, a fine type of... And that's, so, so they claim what they're looking at is a hot dust storm. Well, silica is sand pretty much, isn't it? Yeah, basically. <laughs> And we make glass from it. That's right. Your lenses, your lenses are made of it, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. Why do you suppose they didn't post the picture that it took? Would it not? Would we not? It didn't able take to a see? picture. It took a spectra. Mm -hmm. Oh. I can probably dig it up if you want to see, but it just goes with wavelength, mm -hmm. and it shows ups and downs and spikes and stuff. And there'll be an arrow pointing at the one for for um, CO and methane, and then silicates. <coughs> But now, do you suppose they get that spectra as it's transiting the star or one of the stars? Well, the thing about James Webb is they can take the spectrum just by by blocking out the parent stars and yeah. just looking at the plant, the exoplanet. Oh, really? Uh, this this thing is big and it's and it's far from its star, so it can get far enough away that the star doesn't interfere. It's only what forty light years away, I think. Is that what I said? Yes. Yeah, uh huh. Oh, so yes, like it's, our <laughs> Yeah. Well, do you suppose that's a normal stellar system to be orbiting two stars instead of one of the two? When like you orbit this far out, yes, they're the two stars will look like a single gravitational source to a planet out this far from it. You can think of this, Ron, as though this is Proxima Centauri and those two are Alpha and Beta Centauri. It's a similar setup. Right. Well, Proxima is three stars, right? Proxima is the small red dwarf star that orbits Alpha and Beta Centauri. Oh, it oh, okay. And it's got its own little system, and that's what Proxima is. Yes. Centauri. But the big the do the two other big stars that are orbited by them, they don't have planets? We don't know. Yeah. Really? We, we have know a what's going around the little one, but not the big ones. It's, it's, it's the closest star. It's only four light years. It's it's easier to find planets around small stars because they tug their star more. Oh, I see. When we did the uh, simulation of uh, thirty nine objects in, in the universe, one of the things that Farshad did was a uh, uh, a, a single planet around a binary pair, and he did the same thing you were just talking about. It was quite a ways out. But the uh, planets orbit over many, many, you know, orbits slowly rotated about the main one because it was still getting tugged on by the not exactly constant gravity from the binary pair. That was what, two years ago or three years ago in December? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Three, three or four years ago, I think. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Well, do you suppose because of the closeness, uh, James Webb has got an actual picture of Proxima, the planet? Well, well you've got amateurs like that have taken pictures of Proxima. Proxima is not the planet. Proxima is the red dwarf star. Okay, but we know there's a planet that they're thinking might be, a, you know, livable. They Why think two. They think two around, around Proxima. Two, huh? Uh, one may be in a habitable zone, but small stars like that, red dwarf stars, tend to be very active as far as um, coronal mass ejections and flares and things. And so likely not, not you know, in a habitable zone if the star were well behaved, but it isn't well behaved. And those planets are what? Proxima A, Proxima B, or? Uh, well, let's start with B, with small b. The star itself is A. Yeah. I got it. Okay. Fascinating. Be interesting to look, be going around a red dwarf, wouldn't it? Your daytimes would be red. Mm -hmm. yes. Not bright. Here we go. Aha. We're going to do there, Hansel and Gretel. 
the fairy tale, breadcrumbs left in the forest, now, and we're going to do something. Now, you'll recall that we talked about um, a while ago, both on Mars and the moon, there are um, pit, uh, uh, pits that we can see on the surface. And when an infrared sensor <laughs> goes over these, it can measure the temperature in the pit. And the temperature is a very benign and constant, about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So putting some kind of a settlement or something in one of these pits, which is actually probably a collapsed lava tube, um, and therefore would also protect you from radiation, uh, which is a big, a big plus for setting up a, a, a main moon base or a Mars base. So these things are going to be explored by small um, rovers that will be launched from a mother rover. And they will go down and like Hansel and Gretel, they will go down into the lava tube. But since they don't know where the lava tube goes and they want to explore it, the rock would block the signals between the two rovers. So the article um, discusses the development of small... Um, this is the parent rover. These are small other rovers. But as these rovers go, go down in there, they will leave behind uh, relay stations that are about the size of an AirPod uh, case, you know, which is about a, an inch cube. And so you would leave these things. They're cheap, and you'd leave them along every time you made a turn so the, the data and the picture won't be lost. You come back up here, and then this sends it up to the parent thing on the surface and then it gets sent back to Earth. Like a mini little Wi-Fi network. Yes. Yeah. Or a mini little thumb drive or something that would hold. Uh, like a, like a Wi-Fi transmitter. Yeah. So inside a square cube, of the, an inch square is a transmitter and a receiver? Yeah. Yep. A little relay. Is that a battery. What, is that pretty much what Professor Lubins of UCSB wants to send uh, to Proxima? Very well, similar. There's an, there's an analogy to his um, light sail to um, a whole parade because they're going to send waves of them and they'll relay the signal back. Okay, in a way that's being done now with Perseverance and its helicopter, isn't it? Yeah, the helicopter doesn't communicate directly with Earth, so we get it through Perseverance, the ra the rover, the lander. Did you did you see a picture of it? Uh, it found the the parachute way over next to a butte on Mars. I know that's a quick run here from what we're talking about, but they found the uh, the, the stuff that it was brought in on Mars and dropped yep. it. And well, anyway, that's next week. There's a lunar <laughs> orbiter that ta has taken pictures of all the debris that have that have been shut. Uh, um, what is it, thrown off by landing uh, probes on Mars. You know, the heat shield and the parachute and things like that. So they've pretty much all been located. Well, here's what I don't understand about what you said on this picture, Jerry. You said yeah. 70 degrees. There's right. no air on the moon. What is 70 degrees? The rocks? Yep, the rocks. Only the rocks that would get the sunshine, though, though right? Well, right. as as the sun moves, the the sun, you know, where it heats up, moves. So it do, doesn't build up to the same three hundred degrees plus that the surface of the moon can get to. It averages out. It's got a big low pass filter. You know, if you go into a gold mine or something here on Earth, you find that the temperatures is very constant year round in there. I had an experience when I went through the lava tubes up in. <clears throat> Northeast California, I forget where the right. nearest town was. But anyway, uh, I had a Coleman lantern, a real one that was running, you know, wet gas. Yes. And I went down into the lava tubes and the, the temperature was very nice, but my uh, Coleman ladder started to go out. Yeah, that's yeah. a sign that you should too. Yeah, I was, oh, yeah. I'm not gonna mention that's up near Bernie Falls, in Northern California. Yeah. I've been in those tubes, they're really something field of them now look at this this is a uh, what a, a black hole supermassive leaving its home this, galaxy being the, injected um, by another black people hole. at the keck observatory in hawaii uh, uh, van dokum uh, discovered this streak 
which is about 200,000 light years long. Jeez. And um, it's twice the diameter of our galaxy. Bigger than, yeah. Well, it depends on how you define the edge of our galaxy. It's pretty it's like it's making it bigger. So they discuss in the article that discusses this, that they say that the uh, solution they've hit on is that this is a rapidly moving black hole and it's leaving behind it a trail of dust and star formation. Um, but if that was, and so they, they think this was a um, three galaxy collision, each with a major supermassive black mm -hmm. hole and three objects are capable of throwing one object out at very high speed. And that would be this object going out there. And they, it doesn't show in the picture, but they believe that they see two slower trails going out the other way for the other two black holes, which is consistent with conservation of energy and momentum for a three body slingshot. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, if that line, and, that's, yeah. if that streak is twice the, the uh, diameter of our galaxy, why couldn't that just be full of stars? That, that white uh, streak. These, these things here are galaxies. Okay, so but this, I, this would have come from here, and you would not, you can't resolve stars in here or in here, but but so you probably don't resolve a star here. It's got to be something more active and bigger. So when this black <laughs> hole got ejected, it probably took a lot of friends and relatives with it, and so it, it's being shedded as the accretion disk comes off as it flies away. Wow. Uh, wow. And that's how many billion light years away? away? About nine? Let's see. Do, do, do. Oh, I didn't highlight different things in this one. That was before our solar system was even created. Where yeah, this was about eight billion year, light years away. Wow. God. More than half the universe's age. You suppose they have computer systems that can tell you where all that stuff we see in the past is now? <laughs> yes, they do, provided you make certain assumptions about what its motion is going to be when we can't see it. So <clears throat> to the um, extent that uh, the assumptions are right, then yes, we can project forward where things are going to be. And Ron, that's why you'll hear people talk there are two different distance measurements that people use when they talk about how far away these things are. So right. like Jerry says, this is 8 billion light years away. That's what called, that's look back time. That's where it was when it emitted this light. Okay. And that light took 8 billion years to get to us. But in the interim, the expansion of space has moved it much farther away so that now it actually is much farther away. So you'll hear, you'll hear people say the radius of the universe is about 13.8 billion light years. That's look back time. Or you'll hear what's called co-moving time, where they'll say, oh, the radius of the universe is 47 billion light years. That's where the stuff that was 13.8 billion light years away when the light emitted is now. Well, I, I know we only got two minutes, but it's uh, dark energy, they think, that's pushing it apart too, right? Yeah. That's the, that's the sor apparently the source of the expansion. And now there's a theory that says that's based on what we're looking at on the screen here, a black hole, a supermassive monster. And Well, this is a different property of black holes. Yeah. This is outside the black hole, and this is its accretion disk just being shed off. That's the debris trail it's leaving behind. God. But, but yeah, Ron's referring to that cosmic coupling that we, we talked about last oh, week. Oh, okay. Coupling. We got that cosmic about that coupling again, is a that cosmic coupling is a theory. Yeah. So it's yeah, but it does have um, a bit of observational proof attached to it, a correlation. It's got uh, Hawkins radiation, and it's not supposed to let light lead of it, and yet stuff's evaporating somehow anyway. I don't. It's crazy. That's why we love this so much, gentlemen. And I can't wait for next week. Actually, next uh, weekend is going to be a busy one, isn't it? We're going to have a Friday night. With, uh, Dr. Saturday. Gilly, Toronto. Bruce. Saturday night. And a Sunday night. Well, what are we having? Uh, let's see. We're going to have a star party if weather permits. And even last minute, we've been known to call it, haven't we? Yeah. If it were <laughs> you. I guess I'm, 
Have you heard from Tom Totten? I'm hoping that he sent the word out or the Zoom connection link to our our professor up in University of Toronto. And, and then I guess all, every, all the members of the club get a link to Zoom to watch us and also yeah. watch Friday night. Yeah. So it should be an interesting weekend. In the meantime, gentlemen, I guess we run out of time. It's an hour and it goes by so quick and I learn so much and I forget half of it, damn it. <laughs> do it again next week take care of your wives and yourselves stay healthy and keep looking at the universe as uh, Casey Kasem used to said remember him at the end of the top 10 he'd say keep your feet on the ground and keep looking for the stars or reaching you know my, my astronomy clock here says that this coming Sunday night is going to be a, a good astronomy night and mostly clear alright All right, let's hope yeah, yeah. So, 